Hi, my name is Stian Hoklev. I'm a PhD student here at the University of Toronto, Faculty of Education, and I'm also the data manager for Coursera and edX MOOCs here at the university. Uh, Bodong asked me to talk a little bit about data wrangling in the context of learning analytics, and uh, it's a very applied topic. There isn't really a lot of theory, and if there is, I'm not the right person to talk about it. So instead, I thought I'd just give you a very quick walkthrough of uh, some of the work that I've been doing and some of the issues that uh, we have been working on, uh, especially in the context of MOOC data, which tends to be quite messy, uh, but perhaps a good example of the kind of challenges that you can run into when you want to do learning analytics. So this looks... Um, very complicated. This is uh, probably some of the most difficult data you could run into uh, just because um, it's a very strange format that was made up by the Coursera platform. So this is a dump of a quiz. Uh, it's an introductory quiz or actually a questionnaire but we used the quiz module and from Coursera so you've got about 20,000 responses from students in a, in a single course. And this is the top of the text file where you see you have some question definitions. But if you look at question number one, there's a bunch of JavaScript. Uh, so actually the way in this case to get a um, multi-choice question was to embed a bunch of JavaScript into the question definition. So that's uh, quite hacky and of course it makes it much more difficult to get the information out of the file. If we go further down into this file uh, to get to the actual answers, here's an example of one single answer from a given student. And again you see that this isn't any format that you're really familiar with. Um, the numbers there, 44544544, which you see on the second line, actually correspond to choices in that little JavaScript blob. So decoding this uh, was a bit of a challenge, and it's the kind of thing where you really just need to sit down and write a script, uh, whether that's Python or Ruby or whatever else you're comfortable with. Um, hopefully you won't run into this particular situation too, too often, but it's, um, it can happen. Also, if you do run into it, hopefully it's with a tool that's used by a lot of people so that perhaps someone has already done that job, or if uh, you are starting to do it, then you can find other people who you can collaborate with. Um, either way, what we ended up doing was, uh, in this case, to develop a, a script that could take this uh, file and turn it into a CSV file, and which looks like this. So, again, if you just kind of glaze over this, it still looks very complicated, but actually it's very simple. Um, a CSV just means co comma-separated, and so uh, you have... Um, the first uh, line here is the titles, uh, so you, and I've shortened them a little bit because it becomes easier later in the process if each uh, title or uh, column header is actually one word. Um, so user category, uh, then there are some questions about why did you enroll, um, there's how many hours per week are you going to spend, what's your gender, and so on. And further down for each line, um, each position corresponds to the header. So. For online two, you see user category, lifelong learner. Is it relevant to the academic study? I'm neutral about that, and so on and so on. So this is an extremely standard format, which you can import into a lot of different programs. Uh, for example, Excel. So Excel is a great uh, place to start if you want to just quickly have a look at the data. Here you see it's exactly the same data, except now um, we get it in these nice columns. However, uh, you have to be uh, careful with Excel because um, you see here, for example, on column G, um, actually the question was hours per week, and yet we see a lot of dates. So that is because Excel sometimes will overinterpret data, and um, in row two there you see 6th of April. Okay, what do you think was actually in the data file? four to six hours per week, right? So four to six, and Excel interpreted that as, oh, 
that's dates. I'm going to show it to you as dates, right? So whenever you use Excel, just be um, careful about that. It can easily interpret columns as um, currency, as time, as date, uh, as other things. And then if you save it, you might actually get that error uh, compounded. So just uh, something to keep in mind. Now, here's a little trick that uh, I think is quite important. Um, when I... Uh, so typically when you work with data you will have to combine data from a bunch of different files it might be slightly different so you might have to do things to make it um, work together uh, align columns you know make sure the, the names line up and so on it can be tempting to do that straight in the raw files so I could go into that Excel spreadsheet and if I saw an error I could go in and fix it what I like to do is to keep the data as raw as possible and to do all those modifications in the code. So this, I'm going to use R um, in this demonstration. It's a, it's a really great tool, but you could do this in other programs as well. So in this case, I have actually five separate quizzes um, or surveys from five different courses. And I read them in here uh, just straight from the CSV files, as you see there and uh, then I add them, I join them together into a DB, which is just a, 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 you think of it as a big spreadsheet, right? And then I'm going to do some things to the data to clean it up. But I'm doing that all in the code. And the advantage of that is it's all documented. So if anyone asks you how come this column ended up like this, you can go back and, and look exactly at what you did. What if someone comes along and says, oh, you know, a bunch of new students, um, did the statistics uh, survey. So here's a new downloaded file that you have to go in and, and put into your statistics. Uh, rather than trying to redo all the steps to clean it up, uh, you should be able to just rerun this whole script and have those uh, changes applied. So I'll show you how this works. Um, here's an example of uh, cleaning up. Um, typically, uh, you'll have some missing values. Um, and there, they might be a, a, an empty string, they might be a zero, uh, they might be sometimes minus one or minus 99 or whatever. And in R, uh, we want to represent that as an NA, a missing value. Because uh, the program understands that, and it means that if you do, for example, an average, it will just skip uh, the, the missing values. Right? Whereas if you have a bunch of zeros, it's actually going to pull down the average quite a bit. So this is just um, a quick uh, function that, um, that uh, modifies all of those values. Right? And again, this is something I could have done in Excel. Um, I'm doing it here instead. Okay. And then here's another example of something I had to do. Um, most of the questions in this, these surveys were the same, but sometimes the... Um, options actually didn't line up. So, for example, um, in some of the surveys, they asked for, did you spend 10 to 12 hours per week, 13 to 15 hours per week, or more than 15 hours per week? And in another uh, survey, they asked, did you spend 10 or more hours per week? So, in order to be able to compare these quizzes, I I'd have to replay, uh, to um, make the data line up, so I had to choose the, the lesser uh, granularity, so I just turned the 10 to 12, 13 to 15 and, 15 and above into 10 or more, right? And so again, by documenting this in the code, I can always go back here and look at what choices I made and um, why. Another thing I'm doing here at the bottom is to order um, these uh, values, because if I plot the values, um, I always want 1 to 3 to be on the left, and then 4 to 6, and then 7 to 9, and 10 or more. But if these were, for example, colors, blue, green, red, then the order wouldn't really matter. So I have to tell R that the order does matter, right? And I do a bunch of this kind of stuff to, cl to clean up all the different values to make sure that they're consistent. Um, one great thing about uh, R is that it's a programming language, okay? It's a bit of a strange programming language. It's very optimized for statistics, but it means that you can do functions, right? So instead of saying, fix this column, fix this column, fix this column, I just say, here's a tiny little function 
that uh, does something to a Likert style column, right, above there, ordered Likert, right, and all I do again is order them, so that strongly disagree comes on the left and strongly agree comes all the way on the right. And then I have a list of the columns that I want this transformation applied to. So these are the five Likert style questions. And then I just say, go through and apply this function to all of these columns. So again, if, if there suddenly were added a few questions that were also Likert style, I could just add them to this list and, and very quickly make sure that they're also transformed. And then the last thing I do in this script is I save um, the output that's been transformed into um, an, a file that's in the R save format. So the sad thing about this is I can't load this file into any other program. But the reason why I want to save it in a rich format rather than CSV is that in CSV you would lose all these um, orderings, for example, that I've applied, right? And this means that I can have a separate script that does analysis, that does graphing, that does actually the, the statistics and, and the learning analytics that's interesting. I can just start by loading this file. But I retain the script that generated the file so that at any time I can go back, I can add data or I can refine um, the processing and I can regenerate the save file. Okay, And you can find a bit more details about how I set this up on my blog and I'll give uh, Bodong the, the URL to that blog post. So I talked a little bit about uh, just working with uh, text file dumps and loading them in and joining them and processing them. I want to talk a little bit about databases and specifically SQL. And if you work on learning analytics, uh, it's quite probable that you will come across uh, databases or database dumps uh, because most learning management systems use them, whether it's Blackboard or WordPress or, in this case, uh, Coursera. That's the backing data uh, storage that they have. And so if someone's giving you access, they might give you access to a live database or they might give you a dump, which you then can load into a local database server, and then you can access it. And that's what happened here. Coursera uh, sent me a total dump of the entire course data for a specific, for a bunch of courses here you see. And I was able to load those into my local um, database, and then I can go in and query. And working with databases is a little bit complicated at first, but I would suggest that if you're interested in this field, it's a skill that is uh, very, very valuable. And again, um, you can do all this on the command line. Um, I found using a GUI app uh, that lets you just browse the database is really helpful for exploring the data. So in this case, um, you see here I've selected on the top left a database. So this is uh, a specific Coursera course. That database has a bunch of tables and you can think of each table as a kind of a spreadsheet. Uh, it has headers as you see on top here uh, and it has values. Each row is, is, a, is, a, is a record. Now the complicated part though is that uh, there are often relationships between these different tables. But anyway, you can see here there's a few different views at the top of the, the screen. So you see the structure, the content. Right now we're looking at the content. And of course there's you know, maybe 20, 30,000 lines here. So this is just giving us a quick view of how the data looks like. Uh, but we can go and look at the structure. And this tells us what those headers are and what type they have. And so this is a bit different from Excel because it's more explicit. So in Excel, um, you know, Excel read in the CSV and it tried to guess what format each column was. Uh, and it's not going to stop you from putting a string into a column that has all dates. Whereas here, um, you know that the ID is always going to be an int, which means uh, it's a number, um, an integer. You know that uh, a non user ID will always be uh, a string, is varchar, means a string. And uh, achievement level is an enum. And so you know that it will only have these three possible values, right? So it's either normal, distinction, or uh, the last one there, which you can't quite read, right? So this is already telling us something about the structure of this table. 
And then to um, work with this table, we write queries in SQL. And that's a little bit complicated, but it's a very rich language. And again, it's absolutely worth it to uh, learn it, uh, to, to start playing around with it. And just loading in such a database, and you can find um, open source databases as well, and just playing around with it a, a little bit is actually quite useful. There's also uh, some MOOCs on uh, SQL, so you could look at that. So here's just an example of a very simple SQL query. And I'm saying, I want, so select asks for what do you want to see? What do you want as the output? So I want the user IDs. Okay. Where do you want them from? I want them from the course grades table, right? If I stop there, it would just give me all the user IDs. But I only want the user IDs where the achievement level, which is the grade that they got, equals distinct distinction. Okay, so, great. That's not very complicated. But, as I said, these columns are often uh, connected to each other. So, let's say I'm interested in how many forum posts or forum comments different users have written. Here's another table that contains, so there's one line, one row per comment or per post. Okay, And it has uh, the forum user ID, which refers to who wrote this comment. Okay. The problem is that we have another table with the grades that has the Anon user ID. So how do we connect an Anon user ID to a forum user ID? Well, it turns out in this case, they have another table which has mappings between four different kinds of IDs. And so they're doing this a bit, a bit, making this a bit complicated, and that's for uh, for privacy and security reasons. So, um, but in this case, we need to be able to connect these together. So really, we need to connect three tables together uh, if we want to, for example, graph the relationship between the grade that you got and how many posts that you wrote, which is a very simple, um, very basic kind of query for a learning analytics study, right? So if you look on the top here, we have a little bit more sophisticated uh, SQL query. If you start by looking in the, the from, we define the three tables we're going to work with, and we give them short names, just to make it simpler. Okay? Then we say, what do we want to see? Well, we want the user ID, and then we want the number of posts. In the where, we say we connect it up together. So we say the Anon user ID in course grade should match the Anon user ID in uh, hash mapping, and the form user ID in hash mapping should add the form posts, the, the form user ID in form posts. So a bit complicated, but again, there's lots of resources for learning this. I'm not going to teach you all about it now, but I'm just showing you how in a few lines you can actually do quite sophisticated stuff. Now, another alternative is to load a whole table into something like R and use all the functionality of R to combine these, right? Um, but sometimes, uh, let's say that you have a million records and you're only interested in a very small subset of those, um, doing that selection in SQL instead of in R will save you a lot of time. And this is also great for just quickly um, exploring your data. So, so far we've just produced all these lists, we haven't actually come up with any insights. But uh, here's a third um, little SQL query where we say, what is the average number of posts and group it by uh, grade level, okay? And so if you see at the bottom there, you see that uh, the, the people who got a distinction in this course on average wrote 17 posts. The people who uh, got a statement of accomplishment, but um, so they finished the course, it's called normal, they did 10 posts, and the people who didn't finish the course for some reason, they wrote four posts, okay? So now we're actually combining the input from three different tables, and we're doing some statistics, some summary statistics over it. Okay, so all of this in, in a few lines of code, very, very quickly. Um, done in this in this application, so uh, it's quite fun to just play around with. But the next level is to uh, bring this into a proper statistics program, and most tools have connections to 
uh, to SQL, and so this is R. But I'm using R Studio, which um, has a bunch of different uh, good features. So you can do literate programming here. You see, I have these comments, so I can document what I'm doing. Um, I can see on the on the right side exactly what's happening, and so on. Here, all I'm doing is I, I'm connecting to the database, and then I'm downloading an entire table. So this would be the simplest way of doing it, is just say, here's a table, give it to me, and I'll do all the processing in R. And here you see uh, the table, right? And so you can do anything that you usually do with a data frame in R with this data. You could read in another table, you could do a join, a merge, a filter, uh, using what you know in R. Uh, but you can also use R to execute a query. So here you see on the left side this query that we developed. Um, and now we're running this query and we're getting back uh, the results, but now as an R data frame that we can actually keep working with the data. Okay. Now let's, instead of just getting the summary statistics, because knowing that distinction is 17, you know, that the, we don't know how the distribution is. So instead, let's uh, change our query a little bit and say, give me a list of uh, students. For each student, I want to know their grade and the number of posts. And now I can actually have some data to plot. Okay. And so here you see we have 4,000 rows. Um, we have the achievement level on the left, and we have the um, number of posts on the right. Okay. So now we have something to work with, and we can very quickly plot that with ggplot. So you see that in the bottom um, right frame is that I do, did a, a quick density plot. And here you see the um, red are the ones who got distinction, the blue are the normal ones, and the green are the ones who didn't finish the course. And again, uh, we've combined data from three different tables. We've pulled it into R. We've done some summary statistics uh, on the number of posts, and then we've plotted it. Um, and all of this in, you know, 15 minutes of work. So, you know, this is not very sophisticated data analysis if you're coming at it from that perspective. There's all kinds of statistical tests you can do. Um, but just in terms of getting the data to a stage where you can start analyzing it, um, that's kind of the first step, and that's what data wrangling is all about. R Studio is not the only tool that you can use. Um, there's a lot of different statistics tools, and one um, kind of all-around programming tool that's becoming more and more uh, uh, useful as well is IPython Notebook. So Python is a, is a, um, a general programming language. So it's very powerful um, database interactivity, um, web APIs, uh, all kinds of stuff and also quite good support for statistical analysis. And uh, IPython Notebook is an interface similar to RStudio where you can have text, you can have uh, code, you can have the outputs, the graphs, and that's uh, great for sharing with others. And here's just an example of, of me working through uh, some statistics uh, also on the Coursera click log. So the click log, um, was another challenge. Basically, we had three different data sources for the Coursera data. The first was the queer, the um, surveys, um, and the quiz data, which I showed you how it came in these uh, weird text files, and we had to do quite a bit of processing to be able to um, work with it. The second is the database um, dumps, which on the one hand, it's already nicely structured data with um, schemas and stuff like that, but the problem is that the data tends to be scattered across a lot of different tables, and so you need to do some work just in joining them together and finding out how uh, the data is structured. The third thing we got is uh, the click log, and a click log is um, basically a list of every single action that a user performs. So in this case, every time you send a request to the server, could be that you're um, asking for a new page, that you're uh, pausing the video, that you're play, replaying the video. Anytime you have a request going to the server, uh, it logs it to a file. Um, and this file is also, again, at first look, it doesn't look great. But you can imagine each of these uh, lines or multi-lines here 
have uh, this is uh, called JSON, and so they have a bunch of keys and values, right? Now the problem in this case is that we didn't have an overview of all the possible keys. So uh, if you look here in the middle of the screen towards the end, you see there's a key called 12, and there's a key called 13. And we still don't know exactly what those keys mean, so we just had to kind of skip them. So we had to go through here and do a lot of guesswork, and this is not ideal, of course, but sometimes that's where you end up. Um, the first thing we did, and, and so these files tend to be very big, because a single user in a single half an hour could generate hundreds or thousands of these events. Um, multiply that by 30, 40,000 users over a two-month period, and you can end up with um, gigabytes of text files. And so suddenly um, loading this, so the first thing is, of course, writing a script that transforms this into CSV or something else that you could work with. But in this case, loading that straight into um, Excel or R uh, is just not workable. It's too large. And so you really need to think about different ways of, of processing big data. Um, so the first step here was to um, go through and uh, generate a table. And this table um, only has numbers because if you have so big data, uh, storing numbers is a lot faster, uh, so it takes a lot less space than storing the full values. Uh, so we have a separate lookup table. So if you see here on the left, it says action, one, one, two, three, three, three. And so we have a separate table that says action one is uh, viewing video. Action two is uh, posting a blog or whatever, right? And that way you save a lot of disk space and memory space. Um, so this was the first, and, and this would actually take hours just to process one course and get it into this format. But we still had you know thousands and thousands of events per user. And this is where uh, it really depends what your data analysis research question is. I mean, what kind of analytics do you want to do? And what, how do you need to structure the data to be able to answer those questions? Uh, so we were really interested in... Uh, first of all, just sorting this um, sequentially and separating it out by each student, because in the previous view, the, each you know all the students were kind of jumbled together. And so here's a simple uh, representation of a one single student, and you can see what they did. They d attempted the survey. They got feedback on the survey. They clicked around uh, in a in a video. So you see it's the same video, 52, but they maybe paused it, stopped it, paused it. Uh, then they went into the human grading, right? So already going from the text file that you see in the background, um, we've gotten into a level where we can kind of follow along as a student is uh, going through different motions. And then the next step again was to reduce this further uh, and tag these lecture views because we, you might have four or five or six different um, events during a single video. And so what we turned this into for our specific purposes was to say, you know, he watched the lecture. Um, the lecture was not the one following the, the lecture he watched. So if lecture five, he didn't watch lecture six, right? He jumped to lecture eight, for example. While he was watching, he jumped around and he paused. Okay, so those were a few tags that we applied to each video. So again, this is a lot of data. So this little screenshot might represent um, you know, several hundred events. And because we're looking not just at each individual event, but we are maintaining uh, a context because we want to know, OK, you're watching video eight before, but which videos have you watched already? Right. So again, quite a lot of uh, just um, processing needed because of the specific questions that we wanted to ask. Uh, if you wanted to ask different questions, you would need to process the data quite differently. So I think I'll stop there. Um, this is, uh, the, you know, uh, data munging, data wrangling is uh, a huge topic. Uh, I saw that Baldong has posted some really great, um, some really great resources. Uh, there's so many tools coming out now that are trying to make it easier. 
and for some data forms uh, it can be much easier there are some click and uh, play kind of tools um, but if you're really going to be prepared to deal with any kind of data I think it's important to learn a little bit of programming uh, Python is a great place to start um, R and R Studio are really great tools knowing a little bit about uh, SQL for uh, database processing and just gaining a lot of experience. Right now, the great thing is that there's so many public data sets available that you can download and you can experiment with. There's a lot of great people blogging about how they process data. Um, so it's something that's absolutely learnable and it's an incredibly useful skill to have, I found in my work, um, even working with PhD students in statistics who are much more sophisticated than I am when it comes to statistical modeling. Um, they often wouldn't have the practical skills to actually get the data into the format that they could work with, and so they really needed um, my help. And that's one place where you can make yourself very useful as well. So I'll stop there. I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you.